You are about to listen to my conversation with Rachel Timothy, a woman from Illinois who, when she was just nine years old, was dragged into the cruel world of child sex trafficking and pedophilia by a teacher and basketball coach at her elementary school. She recently published a book named Open Blind Eyes that documents her entire story in hopes of bringing attention to the reality of both the viciousness of sex trafficking and child sex trafficking more specifically, and just how common it is in our communities and the country at large. The book also gives valuable insight into how a child can even get wrapped up in such a thing in the first place. And Rachel's story, while it is in part inspiring, is also largely disturbing. So viewer discretion is advised for this episode. That being said, in order to pay proper thanks to the wonderful sponsors of this show, I will be running their commercials successively after this introduction rather than playing them in the middle of this intense conversation that you're about to listen to. So without further ado, here are some shout outs to sponsors that I hope you enjoy. Since 1950, Dave's Supermarket in Fairbury has been wowing customers throughout central Illinois with their unmatched customer service, delectable deli market, beloved grocery carryout service, and many other fortes, which is why they've earned hundreds of five-star reviews online. Dave's 3rd Street Deli has plenty of seating and is a destination place to meet your family and friends for good food, fun, and fellowship. Not only is their homestyle fried chicken here the best around, but you can also enjoy free coffee and 50 cent ice cream every single day. And be sure to check out their Old World Bakery while you're here, where freshly baked goods are prepared every morning. You'll find hundreds of unique and signature items here at Dave's that you won't find anywhere else, like their famous potato salad, ham loaf, and canned meats, just to name a few. Dave's Supermarket is open Monday through Saturday from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. and offers online shopping and curbside services. Come experience this revered location that puts a super in supermarket when you shop at Dave's in Fairbury, Illinois. Wowing the customer for over 70 years. Valentine's Day is coming up, and you do not want to be the person who doesn't get your special someone a beautiful bouquet of flowers. The gift of flowers has long been a way of expressing your love and admiration for your significant other on this centuries-old holiday. But if you attempt to go out and find your own flowers, arrange them nicely, and get them to your person on time, you can go wrong in so many different ways. Lucky for you, Nature's Designs by Tiff in Fairbury, Illinois, is taking all the stress out of the holiday this year so that you can fully enjoy it with the person you love. Just call them up at 815-692-3024 and tell them that you would like some flowers to be delivered to your loved one's address on Valentine's Day. You can even ask that they deliver in the morning or in the afternoon, and they can even include chocolates, stuffed animals, candles, and bath products, plants, and other cute gift items to really put a smile on their face. So don't delay. Trust me, don't delay. Call up Nature's Design by Tiff and Fairbury at 815-692-3024 and schedule your incredible Valentine's Day delivery package and make this Valentine's Day the best one yet. Hoffman's Little Acres is a family-owned and operated farm in Fairbury, Illinois that raises their animals the way God intended. They sell meat and dairy products as well as eggs, honey, and locally renowned goat milk soap alongside other popular bath products. And it's all sourced from their very own wholesome farmstead. Reconnect with where your food comes from when you come and visit this fun family farm where the animals have names, not numbers. Animal visits in the spring and summer by appointment only. That's Hoffman's Little Acres in Fairbury, Illinois, a wholesome family farm.
Before this episode begins, I need to tell you about my wonderful friends at Fairbury Furniture in Fairbury, Illinois. Fairbury Furniture is a trusted family-owned business with a massive showroom full of all the furniture items you could possibly want from all the brands that you know and love, like Tempur-Pedic, Leather Italia, Ashley, Sealy, Best Home Furnishings, and many, many others. On a personal note, I actually have a long history with destroying office chairs. I'm aggressively fidgety, and I always screw around with the the thing, you know what I mean? And screws always fall out and the back supports always give out within a month. And I'm not kidding. However, I got these chairs, these three chairs that I use on the podcast from Fairbury Furniture close to a year ago, and they are as sturdy and wonderful today as the day that I got them. So for quality assurance, a gorgeous selection, and incredible customer service, go check out Fairbury Furniture in Fairbury, Illinois, and tell them that you heard about them on the Paul Garcia Show. That's Fairbury Furniture, Central Illinois' premier furniture store. And now, my conversation with Rachel Timothy. Rachel Timothy and Jeff Walker, thank you both so much for joining me today. I appreciate your time very much. Well, well, thank you for having us. Absolutely. My pleasure. And Rachel, I mean, I want to thank you especially because your story, I imagine, is not at all easy to talk about, yet you do it in order to educate and inspire people. And I just think that's so brave. So again, thank you very much. Thanks. I'm very thankful for the opportunity. Um, you know, not many people get to have a chance to share their story and be heard and their voice be heard. And so I'm thankful. It's a blessing. Well, it's a pleasure to give you the platform. And I'm going to ask you both just to give a brief bio, uh, an introduction to who you are. So Rachel, I'll start with you. I know most of the audience uh, who's watching this already knows who you are. But for those who don't, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and maybe a little bit about what you've lived through? Okay, sure. Um, so currently I'm a wife and I have four kids and very busy with doing all those things, um, enjoying it very much. But kind of the reason that I've been given this platform is uh, trials that I went through starting when I was nine years old um, and I was groomed and then abused and sold um, and trafficked starting at nine years old. And so it's been a growing process. Um, it's been a little bit of uh, hell at times, obviously, but um, God has then used my story to help others. He's given me so much redemption and hope where I'm at now. And so I'm able to kind of hopefully share that with other girls and other victims and survivors. So that's where I sit now is just wanting to be able to share that hope, but also shed light on the evilness of how trafficking can exist all around you and people not even know it. Mm -hmm. so. And what does that word grooming mean just for people who, who haven't heard it before? So grooming, especially with a pedophile is whenever they are doing certain acts for the purpose to get you to trust them, to be obedient to whatever they're wanting you to do. Um, for me, the grooming process was a lot of um, special treatment from my coach at, at my school. Um, he gave me special attention, special compliments, made me feel like I, you know, walked on the moon and um, just gave me a lot of praise that he didn't give to other people and made it to where I trusted him, made it to where um, whenever he asked me to do things that were outside of my comfort zone, I was more willing to do it. But then I was also not wanting him to get in trouble once I realized this was wrong. Um, so the whole grooming process is uh, something that really affects the heart and the mind, especially of a child. And there's really no way to know it until you're already in too deep. Right. Okay. Great explanation. Great definition there. And yeah, it, it was tough to read to say the least. And now before we move on, Jeff, of course, people are going to be wondering who you are and, and what you're doing in this conversation. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do as well? Sure. Um, I'm the president of Guardians Rising, and I've been involved in anti-trafficking work for the past eight years started out as a volunteer once we, uh, my family and I moved to Nashville. And then um, I moved from a volunteer to an investigative position with another organization. And I've been with Guardians for a year now as the president. So um, thankful for the opportunity, thankful for the 
a chance to work with survivors and just try to help out as much as we can. So, okay. I want to just go ahead and just dive right into this thing. Really? I mean, we'll take some steps. We'll transition a little bit, but Rachel, your book, Open Blind Eyes. I read that thing in one day. I spent, well, it, we were snowed in granted, but I mean, <laughs> 10 hours and I could not put that thing down. And while it was well written, it was also the most, it was easily the most difficult read of my entire life. The evil oh, wow. and the grooming and the corruption of the innocent, you know, of the innocence of you, it was all staggering. So I'm curious, when did you write this book and why did you write it? So actually, I finished writing it about three, four years ago. Um, and the reason that I wrote it was for myself. Uh, it was kind of a healing process. And uh, I just sat in my living room and it literally just flowed out of me. Um, chapter after chapter would come. It didn't take me long at all to write it. And I would share it with my friends piece by piece as I would kind of share my heart. Um, and then there was a point, you know, where I finished it. I let maybe five, six friends read it. And they said, you need to publish this. And I was like, yeah, okay. Um, then didn't even think that that was on my radar. Um, and then I started with a new counselor and I remember I like handed her all these pages and I was like, here, read this because it'll catch you up to where I am now. So we don't have to start from day one. And my counselor read it and she was like, Rachel, this needs published. And she's like, people need to know that this exists and how it exists and how it can go hidden and why victims don't come out or right away or, or, you know, how the memories can, you know, be gone for a while. And then all of a sudden just bombard you. Um, she, she's like, all of it is displayed really well in your book. People need to know. And so she actually, um, helped me with the process of publishing it. She, uh, paid for the process because I didn't have the money at the time. And I'm thankful that from what I have made from the book, I've been able to pay her back. Um, and then, she hooked me up with a publisher she has used and really all of the pieces just fell into place from the moment I started writing, God gave me the words and then even the process of publishing it, it was a hundred percent a God thing. Wonderful. And I, I want to talk now about some of the experiences, some of the contents of this book, because I think it could be extremely educational, although it could be a tough pill to swallow for parents who are watching this and really anyone who who watches this or listens to it. Could you tell us just about who your main abuser was and, and how exactly you got pulled into his twisted world, you said, when you were starting at nine years old? That's insane, nine years old. But yeah, how'd you, who was it? You don't have to, of course, say names. I don't know the rules around that stuff, but who was this person in relation to you? And yeah. How did he get you wrapped up in this world? Yeah. So uh, me and my family had just moved to a new town and it was a very small town. And here I was starting the fourth grade and I was focused on making new friends, um, trying to fit in. And it wasn't that long into the school year that uh, the other fourth grade teacher, so he's not my fourth grade teacher, but the other one, um, he called me out of line one day when we were on our way walking to lunch and at first, I didn't know if I was in trouble. I didn't know if I'd done something wrong, broke a rule. Um, but immediately when I got up to him, he had a big smile on his face. And he started to just tell me how excited he was. Our family had moved there. Um, he was also the coach for the girls basketball team. And he already had done his homework on me, which I didn't pick up on, obviously, as a nine-year-old. But he knew that I loved basketball. He knew that I was a preacher's kid, so I loved God. He knew a lot about my family. He was talking about my cousins and my brothers, and he'd done all of this homework to where that first conversation I had with him, I immediately could tell this guy thought I was something special, and um, he made me feel good about myself. And so it wasn't that long after that that um, I was in my classroom, and there was a knock on the door, and a little girl was there holding a note from that same coach asking if I would come to his classroom and my teacher agreed to it. And so I went in his classroom and I sat behind his desk and we just talked basketball and he under started to like dive into my heart, figure out what makes me tick, what uh, loves I have. And, you know, he was telling me when you're in the WNBA, you know, make sure you don't forget little old me and 
just really making a nine-year-old feel like they were something special. And so that was the process of how it all kind of got started. Mm -hmm. And and it's, it's extremely troubling. It's a weird mix of things because I hear him saying these things to you. I hear you recalling what he was saying to you and it's in a way it's touching because you think, Mm -hmm. you know, that's what a nice thing to say to a kid. Only, you know, exactly now you have to mix that with the intentions that he had. And it's, it's confusing, which is a good way to say that you lived your life for years, you know, in mass confusion is like mental chaos, but okay. So he, he garnered your trust and he showed that he cared about you. Forgive me for such a harsh transition here, but then how did he start to, when did the inappropriate stuff begin happening and, and how did that happen? Yeah. And I think another thing to explain too is, you know, he was grooming me, but long before I ever entered the picture, he had groomed the whole community. Um, he had, he was also in the process of grooming my parents. Everybody trusted him. He was an elder of a church, um, you know, a teacher, a coach, very well liked and trusted by everybody. And so when something that should have been a red flag, like me leaving the classroom so many times to go talk to him behind his desk. It wasn't because, oh, it's just him. He's a good guy. He would never do anything. Right. Um, so, so I feel like it's important. I feel like perpetrators purposely put themselves in positions like that where people will trust them, whether it's in, sadly, the church, a school of authority, some way, shape or form. It's calculated. Um, but the way that it started to transition, it happened accidentally. Um, he touched me inappropriately when we were in his classroom and it started with, he was talking about my muscles, how they could get stronger for basketball. Um, he would, you know, touch my abs, he would touch my back. But, um, the first time that his hand went around and touched my chest, uh, I jumped and tears immediately filled my eyes. And I remember his reaction was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That was obviously an accident. Why are you acting like a baby? And in my mind, I was like, oh, why am I acting like a baby? Obviously, he didn't purposefully do that. Um, And so it it was the mind games again. Man, I remember when I first read that part of the book. I mean, the first, my introduction to it, the first few chapters, I had to put it down and just say like a prayer. And I'm not kidding you. I would say, oh, good Lord, like, come on. What? It was just so crazy to read. It was sickening. And I don't say that as an insult to your book at all, but it's just like, wow, that's rough to read. How then did he continue to get your trust after moments like that? Because obviously he somehow justified it if, you know, given what happened later, how did you remain, you know, friends with this guy? And how did you, why did you not walk away? How did he keep you around? So, I mean, granted it, it was months in the process, months of special treatment. Um, I had grown to where I cared for him in my nine-year-old mind. I thought I loved him. And so after that happened, he then started to explain to me that nobody can know about this. Nobody can know about our relationship. Um, He explained that if people knew he would lose his wife, he would lose his kid, his job. And I didn't want to hurt him. And that was, that's the part of that grooming process where um, it is a psychological issue that the victim then feels like they almost have to protect them, protect the perpetrator. And it's messed up and it's twisted, but it happens all the time. Um, and, and so when he went, then the next steps and the next steps, it then started to get put back on me. And he would say things like, well, that was your idea. And so it was all twisted. It was mind games. He would also go through spells where he would be all about me and give me special treatment nonstop. And then all of a sudden, nothing, silence. And he would not even look my direction in the hallway. He would act like I didn't exist and it messed with my head. And I would like long for him to, to want me again, even though it was in a messed up way, that roller coaster ride of emotions for a nine-year-old, it really messed with my head and my heart. And what's craziest is like you said earlier, it was very much calculated and I'm sure he had experience doing this type of thing prior to your experience with him. And 
it's it's so sad because a child's psychology they're still learning the ropes of the world and relationships they have not learned yet what are signs of i shouldn't trust this person they're still learning you know who they can trust at all and it's so sad that yes. this man came in during this pivotal developmental stage of your life and you know he gained your trust of all people and so you're learning that this type of guy is a type of guy you can trust and even if you find out later that that's wrong a lot of those neural circuits are going to be deeply embedded in your brain for years to come even though the reasonable part of you knows that it's wrong to give trust to this guy it's just it people don't realize how much of a psychological toll this type of event when you're a kid can take on you it like it can seriously ruin your whole outlook on people later on and is it fair to say that yes. that was the case oh i have issues with trust for sure and i have issues with understanding when somebody says something are their words what they truly mean or is there a hidden meaning behind it um i'm constantly trying to analyze and figure out is is this the reality or is there something that they want from me? Um, the, just a side note, the other day, I have a little girl who's almost nine years old and um, we had a small tornado that went through our neighborhood not too long ago. And she saw these blue tarps up on the roofs and she said, mom, are those blue tarps like band-aids to where it's going to heal the roof? And it's sweet. And it's a nine-year-old little girl. But I thought to myself, that's how old I was when this evil started for me. That was the thought processes I probably had. And so no wonder I didn't pick up on it. You know, you forget that that's how naive you are at nine years old. You don't have a chance against a, a mastermind like that. Right. Oh, yeah. It's it's not difficult, really, to trick a, a young child at that age, and let alone if you do it very well and in a calculated manner. And that leads me to my next question. How then you speak about in the book, how eventually he asked you to start coming to his house and you got excited about it. Mm -hmm. What could you tell me a, a little bit about that? You know, what were your feelings about the first time you went over and maybe a little bit about some red flags that happened there? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, as a kid, anytime you saw your teacher outside of school, it was a big deal. I remember seeing teachers at the grocery store and being like, oh my goodness, they shop for groceries. Like you just think differently of your teachers. Uh -huh. And so, um, but I remember we were behind his desk and this one particular day he had brought his old yearbook and it was a yearbook where it was probably close to the same age as I was, this is a picture he was showing me of him. And he, I remember he had asked me if I thought he was cute. Um, I remember being a little bit surprised by it, but I said, yes. Um, and then it was almost as if in that, well, and he also asked me if, if we were the same age, would we be boyfriend, girlfriend? And I said, yes, I would, I would, I would in that sense. And, um, I mean, it seemed like at that point we became boyfriend, girlfriend. He got excited. Like there was joy in his eyes, which made me happy. Um, I wanted to make him happy. And so he then came up with the idea of if I take that book home with me, I can then ask my mom on Saturday, hey, can I return this book to my coach who just happened to live two houses down from me? And um, I did. And my mom was OK with it. It seemed like an innocent thing to return a book to a teacher on Saturday. Um, and so I remember going to his house for the first time and it was very similar. Um, his house was set up very similar to his classroom. One of the things about him was he almost always had the lights off in his classroom. He almost always had uh, the blinds shut and his house was the same way. It was very dark, um, but he was in a very good mood. He gave me a tour of the house. Um, he asked if I wanted a snack. I remember he showed me his little music room that was off of the garage and was almost flirtatious with me. And so that first time that I went to his house, it was just fun. And um, I didn't necessarily pick up on any red flags that time. Um, the next time that I went, we at that point kind of started doing it to where I would tell my mom I was going to my friend's house and I would, but then I would maybe leave early. It wasn't uncommon, especially back then, for kids to ride their bikes around town. I mean, it was a village of 300 people, basically. And so I would ride my bike around town for a while, and I would come back and check in with my mom and then go back out. Um, but during 
scheduled times, I would go to his house instead. And um, I remember the first time that he um, started talking to me about taking, letting him take pictures. And um, he made it seem like this fun idea that um, he thought that we could make money. He talked about how I could get my parents a neat Christmas gift, um, all these sorts of things. And to a nine-year-old, I bought into all of it. Um, yep. He showed me pictures of kids that were happy and smiling. And he, you know, said I was more beautiful than all of them. And, and so I agreed to it and we went back to his bedroom and um, sitting on his dresser were three disposable cameras and he made it fun. He was goofy and like making, you know, photographer poses and, and we were laughing and um, that it, it seemed innocent to me. Um, but then when we went to school that next week, I remember sitting behind his desk and um, him talking about the pictures and he said they were good, but he thought they could be better. And I didn't know what he meant by that um, until I went to his house the next time. And this time he showed me pictures of kids, but the, this time the kids didn't have any clothes on. And um, I distinctly remember the change in the faces of the kids from the first group of kids that I saw smiling. And then this group not smiling. It was just, it was something that I picked up on right away. Um, he used scripture. He told me, you know, that I'm just showing the beautiful way that God made me. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, and so I let him take pictures of me without clothes on. And I remember him not being as funny and goofy. He was more serious, which scared me a little bit. I hadn't seen him that way before. And so, um, I don't know, it was, it, that was kind of the biggest drastic change I feel like in the whole process. And it's interesting. It's worth noting that, you know, you noticed all the kids in the second stage of what he was doing all had the same feeling you did is, well, this isn't quite as much fun anymore. That's true. You know? That's true. And I remember him saying, I didn't even have to smile if I didn't want to. So yeah. What then, you know, it's, it's puzzling. It's not puzzling because the crazy thing about your book is it takes us all back to when we were nine years old and we quickly realized that we would have gone along with the, with this as well, you know, and how did he keep you coming back? And if you don't mind, I know it's, it's a touchy subject to say the least, it's very sensitive, but could you tell us what, you know, what, the next stages were because it was a continual progression that was calculated that would, that involved long breaks. And then, you know, for you to start missing him and then he'd kind of capitalize on that and invite you back, say he'd missed you. And then these things would happen uh, for yeah. the span of a couple of years. But what were, what did these events slowly become? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah. So, um, I do remember, after the pictures that there was a point where I started to, uh, I mean, I was a preacher's kid. I knew right from wrong. And so I knew that what we were doing was wrong. I always felt weird around his wife because I, I mean, I, was, I, I don't know. I felt like I was sinning against her in a way. Um, but I also felt like because of the relationship that we had and the fact that I didn't want to hurt him, I didn't have anybody I could talk to except him about it. And so whenever I started to have these red flags and I started to feel like, you know, this isn't right. I remember going to him and, and saying, this isn't right what we're doing. And his response being, well, it was your idea. You're the one that wanted to do it. And it killed me because somehow in my head, I thought he was right. This is me. I'm sinning. I'm dirty. Something's wrong with me. Um, but from there, he would over like overshare his love in a way at times to where I would think that some of that ugliness was gone and going back to his house felt safe. Um, and it felt like I was making him happy, but it progressed from just pictures to then a time when I went, he had somebody else there who had a video camera. And at that point I was taught um, how to make love. And again, he used scripture and he explained to me that the two become one and that I then belong to him after I made love to him. And from there, he then started to bring in other men 
Um, and I remember also at points then being taken somewhere else and seeing money exchanged and it was so messed up and it, it kind of goes to show I, probably the trauma as well as just being a kid. But during one of the periods, whenever he wanted nothing to do with me, I remember leaving my classroom, asking to leave my classroom to go to his and giving him money mm. because I thought maybe this would make it to where he wants me because I'd seen money exchange for me before. Right. And then he got mad at you, which was mm -hmm. uh, an extremely confusing. It, it was it was tough to read because you were confused left and right. And you had every reason to be because things were not checking out, which is, I mean, this is to be expected when a guy is manipulating you in this type of way. And it was just like, not only did you feel like you were sinning, but you were feeling like you were messing up and making all the wrong moves in that you were holding on to the yeah. secret. And I can't imagine the chaos that was going on inside your mind at this time. And I want to ask about that. But first, you know, you, you kind of just went over that he, the making love thing, and then you were at this place and you saw money exchanged. But I think the most troubling part of this book, actually, and that's really saying something, is this making love part. Because, you know, firstly, how old were you? And and he said that, well, I'll just start there. How old were you? And how did he even go about getting you to, I don't want to call it making love, although you do say that in the book, you know, he, he had sex with you. How did he get you to do that? Well, there was really, I don't know. I guess I just became like an obedient ragdoll almost in a sense. Like it's a good word. I was such a, I was such a people pleasing person. Um, and I was so manipulated that, um, thought pro my thought process wasn't normal with anything. Um, it was a very painful process, but yet I didn't even feel like I could show that. Um, and then the guilt and the shame and all that came after that, the darkness that came after that, I don't even know how to explain, but I do feel like it was near that time that I started to have the art of disassociating. And um, it basically, my best definition of disassociating is, you know, as a child, my brain was not developed enough to handle the hell that I was going through. And so I feel like disassociating is a gift from God. I feel like it gave me a chance to almost separate to a different place in my head while this was happening to my body. Um, but in a sense, it also made it to where I lived almost these two separate worlds where I would never think about that dark stuff. I would go on about my life. You know, people saw me as an athlete, as a good student. I was always smiling. They had no idea the darkness I was dealing with. But then I would start to relive things at night. I would have nightmares. I would have this deep pain in my heart. Um, and I couldn't even make sense of it all. It was beyond confusing. Yes. And uh, disorders come from traumatic events all the time, specifically like dissociative disorders. And really, like you said, you thought it was, you know, it's a gift from God. And that kind of makes sense to say, because if your brain were just it allowed you to be totally aware and present in horrible moments, especially ones that continue on, I mean, you would be, your brain would be a fool to let you survive through that. So rather than, you know, persuade you to kill yourself or something like that, I think that it's just saying, look, we're just going to kind of zone out, take you to a different world. You're not going to really be present here mentally so that you're not so traumatized by this that you choose death over this or something like that. But if you didn't disassociate, man, that would be even a deeper kind of hell and, and mm -hmm. mental turmoil, I think. So it's interesting that you put it that way, the disassociation, like it's a gift, because that, that really makes perfect sense, I would say. Yeah, I feel like it was just in the sense in that moment, it protected me. And I feel like it was God's way of protecting me. Um, but I also feel like it made it to where I wasn't able to express to people what was happening either. I couldn't give you the A to Z. This is what just happened in the last hour because of the disassociating. And so, um, you know, a lot of those memories were blocked and that made it difficult for me to get the help that I needed at the time when I needed it. Some of the most 
t- depressed people that I've I've met, clinically depressed people, and I'm no psychiatrist or psychologist or anything, but and they're also some of the best people, which is odd because I mean you're a, you're a remarkable person as well, and these people that I know ended up being some incredibly remarkable people, but they were so depressed or so something. I remember just being puzzled by their ability to be a sobbing mess and so they contemplate suicide so often and then minutes later in some cases they were the happiest most bubbly person that no one would ever suspect of of going through these things so it's it's crazy it's not crazy but it's very interesting to see this time and time again with different people and have you ever met someone who's who's somewhat the same in that they experienced something traumatic and now they have a not disorder, but they they develop the ability to disassociate from moments. Have you met someone like that? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've got the chance to meet many survivors, um, and we've we've all developed that way of kind of separating ourselves from the pain. You have to if you're sur- if you've survived it, you've had to separate yourself some way, shape, or form. I do think perpetrators bank on that. Um, you know, the fact that I disassociated was probably used. I I know it was used against me, um, because it made it less likely for me to be able to tell anybody anything. Um, so I think you can use disassociation against somebody, but, um, I've also met some amazing people. Goodness. I was speaking one time at an event and I would guess she was 75, 80 years old and I'm sharing my story and she is bawling. And she said, Rachel, disassociating. I didn't know that was a thing, but that's what I did when I was a kid. Whenever I was raped over and over again, I disassociated. I thought I was the only one. I didn't even know it was a thing. And here she was 75 years old. And for the first time realizing that was normal for what she went through. And she's not the only one. It's been remarkable to hear other stories of the ways that God protected them in that awful, awful moment of abuse. So is it fair to say, help me to understand this way of thinking. So, you know, when you're in these moments with your coach that were terrible, you would almost be another person. And then when you would go home and live your other life, it's like you were an entirely different person. And did that make it difficult to pull information from this other version of you and even talk about it because it felt like that really wasn't you or what? Well, okay. So I feel like there's a big difference between a split personality and just disassociating. Jeff's agreeing. Um, I don't have, I don't have split personality. I was not a different person. I just shut down. I was basically a zombie. I was zoned out. I was nothing. Um, and so my brain shutting off at that time made it difficult to then share with somebody whenever I was back to my normal self, but I was definitely not a different person. Hey, if I could interject something real quick. So it used to be called NPD, multiple personality disorder. Now it's called DID, disassociative identity disorder. We, that's not Rachel. Rachel is talking about where she was allowed to protect herself during the trauma and disconnect from the trauma and, and just be in a different place. There's a difference between DID and just disassociating so that you protect yourself. Huge difference. Understood. Thank you for clarifying that. And, you know, you said go to the different place, you know, you said zone out. What did that look like? Was it darkness? Was it just not thinking anything? Or did you imagine something else? What did you do during those times? Honestly, I couldn't really tell you. Um, It was, I'm sure it's in my subconscious somewhere, but I just know there was a blank spot. There is time lost. And so I'm not necessarily sure if I was running through a field of flowers or if I was in darkness. I just know I lost that time. Hmm. It, it sounds like so you would like black out more or less. Basically. Yeah. OK. Uh, d- so did that not happen every time? Because you did write about these events in detail, you know, and we'll talk about maybe a few in your book. So those moments you didn't black out. But was it later on that you you did? No. So I did like I disassociated. I was separated from that trauma in that moment, but those memories are still there. 
And so it took a moment when I was an adult and I was in a safe place. And I talk about it in my book, how I was scrolling through Facebook and there was a friend of mine who made a post about her daughter who had done a painting and she was bragging on her daughter. But then she said in the comments below, thank you to, and she said my coach's name for helping her after school. And in my, in my head, in that moment, every one of those memories, not everyone, because they're still slowly coming back, but a lot of those memories just started flooding my head. All those things I had suppressed, blocked out, not allowed myself to experience in the moment, bombarded me. I see. So it's like the information was absolutely there in your brain, mm-hmm. locked away for good yes. reason. And yes. this picture kind of, well, unlocked it and released it all. Yes, okay. exactly. Very interesting. And I want to ask uh, just a couple more questions about the, you know, this er- third and fourth or fourth and fifth and sixth grade time of your life. Uh, for one thing that we didn't mention is I-, I think you said that one time you went into his room and for this lovemaking thing and there was someone else in there and it was his brother with a camera. Mm-hmm. Was this a family affair, a thing that he was like that his family was involved in? Like how crazy that threw me for a loop big time. But what was going on in this house? Like what was, did he have a relationship with multiple people or what? Were they all in on it? I don't really necessarily know how to answer all of what went on and and why both brothers were involved in something so evil. Um, You can make assumptions, but I don't, I don't know the truth. I don't know what the exact reason was. Um, I know whenever you are looking at both of them, just from an outsider's perspective, they really don't seem to have much of a relationship on the outside. Like they hardly ever, they're they're very different. Um, But yet for whatever reason, they both were involved in uh, the process of hurting me. And I, I know and assume others as well. Right. And so they weren't friends, but they were colleagues or coworkers, it seemed. Yes. And I mean, you're getting that from a nine-year-old's perspective, trying to make sense of, and I've, I always say, you can't make sense of evil. You, you just can't. And so I, I don't know how they work together. I don't know if it was purposeful that they seem to not be friends out in public. Um, or just as, at least don't seem to do much out in public. I don't know. The last question here about that time, because uh, again, I know this is taxing for you to talk about, but you talked about in, in the book about a time when you went up to his room and this time there was his brother, but there was also another girl who you went to school with, who is literally your age. And rather than me tell too much about that, could you, could you tell us, what happened there and how did she respond after that? Yeah. Um, I talk about it in my book and the, but I don't talk about it too much outside of that. You know, her and I have had conversations since then and Uh it's something that she doesn't, she doesn't want to go there. She doesn't want to, um, relive the process or have anything to do with justice. She would just wants that part of her life gone and I don't blame her. And I want to respect her wishes as, as much as possible with all of that. Um, but it, I mean, she was there. She obviously had been abused at some point before this, this couldn't have been the first time, but she was angry. Um, I, I appeared to be more of the people pleaser and she was more angry. And, um, you know, we were told to do things with each other on camera and, uh, it was awful. It was just absolutely awful. It is. Yeah. Yes. To say the least. Yeah, for sure. It is awful. It is evil. Uh, And it's really evil on a different level than I'm used to saying something's evil because, he even brought scripture into it for Pete's sakes. I mean, how much more diabolical or you could even argue demonic seeming could someone be to justify one of the most cruel and atrocious acts that someone could do, corrupting the innocent, the most innocent among us in this kind of way, and then justifying it with scripture. It's blasphemy, really. And it's just yes, it's just so tough for me to read and I can't imagine how tough it is for parents to read. And I, I really just want to say, I'm so sorry. 
that you had to go oh, through. Thank this. you. And I know I'm not the only one. Like I've met so many where scriptures used, um, and the the abuse that you read in my book is common. And I think that's why I feel so led to speak out because it's happening all the time. And I want I want people's eyes open to the reality so they can be equipped and educated for themselves and for their kids, for their kids' friends, because it's happening. Right, right. You want to, oh, there's a reason the book's called Open Blind Eyes. It's kind of the yes. goal, the whole thing here. Yes. And okay, so it, you said that this stuff's common, but what's also common is your psychological response to the whole situation. I've had women on this mm -hmm. show who have been abused, not, not in the manner that you were abused by any means, but they were abused by their husbands who even tried to kill them. But one that I had here uh, in, in the studio talked to me about you know, she she was abused and she was even held at gunpoint, but she still loved this man and almost more deeply wanted to help him and, and make him happy and, and bring all his potential forward and help him be the wonderful man that she knew he could be and, and things along these lines. But it's like the abuse kind of bonded them together deeper. And I guess I'd want to ask, is that was that kind of the case for you and maybe then you could tell us the, the big question that people ask who read this book, like, why didn't you tell your parents, you know, and, and we yeah. won't talk about, you know, we talked a little before this, but yeah, but why didn't you just tell someone? So I think Stockholm syndrome is a real thing. Um, and when your mind is messed with, and then you're tortured basic in a sense with, um, first you get the love and then you get the torture and then you get the love and just the back and forth, the psychological Stockholm syndrome and all that goes into that is real. And I don't know that there's any great explanation, um, except for acknowledging that the feelings of love for somebody who's hurting you, it, it's messed up, but it's real. And so it keeps people captive because they don't see from an outsider's perspective, what's really going on. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, like it can even happen in domestic cases. It can happen in, in any situation. Um, but yeah, I've lost my train of thought. I had something really good to say. <laughs> See, this always happens. Hey, no <laughs> big deal. Cut that part out. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's also a, a term called trauma bonding. And trauma when you're trauma yeah. bonded to a, a perpetrator, uh, what she's talking about with Stockholm syndrome yeah, you don't want to get them in trouble. You don't want to hurt them. And that that goes back to the whole psychological issue. But trauma bonding is, is huge in these types of cases. I had a second part of that question for you. And it was, you know, why didn't you tell someone? Why didn't you tell an adult? Um, everyone who reads wonders that. So why didn't you? What was your thought process? Well, for a long time. So I just had the pain. I had the um, nightmares at night. I had a hurt and uh, I don't even know how to explain it except a hurt in my heart. Something wasn't right. There was an, there was an evilness, there was a darkness and I thought something was wrong with me. Um, but I, to help with the hurt, I would cut. Um, and I know that, you know, adults saw that and I was accused of um, just seeking attention. I was, uh, attention seeking preacher's kid is how it was said. Um, and part of me as a kid had the thought process of maybe I am like, what is wrong with me? Why do I hurt so bad? Um, but after the cutting and then, um, I did have suicidal thoughts and I did share that with people. Um, but again, it was, you know, was perceived as just needing attention. And honestly, if you have somebody in your life who is doing those things, it is seeking attention. I needed somebody to notice the pain that I was going through because of the disassociating, because of the extent of my trauma. I don't have the A to Z. I can't explain to you why I'm hurting, but if somebody is cutting, that's not normal something is wrong. Something is happening to them. And so, yes, I was seeking attention. Is, is it in an odd way? It, sure, I guess. But either way, that person needs help and um, counseling. Something needs to be done to figure out what's going on. Um, so to me, that was a way of reaching out. Um, yes, I, it wasn't 
me saying the words, but I was I, seeking help in that way. Also, um, come seventh grade, it was during a period where I um, was not getting any attention from my coach whatsoever. And he had completely just acted like I didn't exist for a while. And I was hurting and I was confused. Um, I did share with a friend um, what little I could make sense in my head that I knew had nothing to do with my coach because I didn't want to get him in trouble, but just enough to be able to share something really bad is happening. And she shared it with teachers who shared it with principals who shared it with my parents and all of it ended up just kind of being brushed under the rug. Once again, seeking attention, um, you know, it, nothing ever came of it, but what I have come to find out now as an adult is a lot of what I saw was just brushing under the rug. Let's not talk about it anymore. And it became very appear, uh, apparent to me that there's no point in coming forward. There were things happening behind the scenes. There were people who were seeing things, who were going to the principal, who were going to the superintendent. I had um, a teacher who walked in, and I did not, I did not remember this, but she walked in with me on his lap in his classroom, and she went and reported that to the superintendent. Um, again, but I didn't know these things were going on behind the scenes. But all of it was still being brushed under the rug. And you mentioned that time that a teacher walked in on you and your coach in a closet, opened yes. the door, and then closed the door or turned around, closed the door and walked away, basically. Yeah. That was crazy. I was like, what was that all about? Was was this a woman teacher? Yes. And it goes right back to, I think she was as groomed as any of us. She believed he was a good guy and made up whatever reason in her head that this was innocent. Man. Absolutely crazy. And the cutting that you mentioned, and you're absolutely right that something is going on when someone, in instances where someone is cutting. And I can sort of explain that because I just finished a book the other day by a world renowned neurologist, Carl Dyseroff. He, he explained the phenomena of cutting. And with cutting, it's always actually like basically 100% of the time, it's because of a chaos inside. And they figured this out from a number of studies and a number of, you know, that analyze these people who do this. But it's like the chaos inside, the confusion, the, just the emotional wreckage inside of them that they can't seem to control is kind of alleviated, at least for a moment, by something they absolutely can control, which is this pain. Like they can bring about a sensation that actually hurts, that they bring upon themselves and finally they're in control and they feel something that they're in control of and that pain kind of that physical pain kind of masks this intangible emotional pain within them and there's it, it's so strange from a neurological perspective that this is such a common thing cutting specifically and there's no reason to do it for simply attention like no one's just gonna yeah. cut for right. no good reason. Just, oh, okay, this is going to hurt, but here we go. Maybe now people will pay attention to me. Not right. at all. Not at all. Right. And it's just, would you say that that makes a little bit of sense? You know, did you cut yes. because to kind of mask that um, that pain inside you? Did it give you a sense yes. of control? Okay. I And I wasn't able, I don't know if it was control. I just know I hurt so bad and control makes sense, but I hurt so bad that the thought would come into my mind of physical pain is better than this type of pain. And it would, it would mask it like you're saying. And honestly, there's still days today where if I'm hurting really bad, the thought will come to my mind of physical pain would be better than this of cutting again. But I, I have control enough now not to, but that thought still crosses my mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, in the timeline of your life, you're getting into seventh and eighth grade. This is kind of the time where kids will hit puberty, especially most girls will have hit it by this point. Did your coach, did he lose interest? You said he stopped talking to you for a while. And now that you're becoming a woman, do you think his attraction to you kind of went away at this point? Or what happened during this stage of your life? I think so. I think the fact that I uh, did hit puberty, I think that led to probably not as many um, times that I was sold. Like I wasn't taken to that little white house um, after the sixth grade. 
And I don't know why, but part of me wonders, you know, I had started my period. Maybe they were worried about me getting pregnant. I don't know. Um, but I do also believe that it, there came a point where he wasn't attracted to me anymore. Um, I no longer looked like a little girl. And, you know, Jeff has done, done a lot of uh, investigating and talking to several people from my old hometown. And it appears he had somebody almost every year, somebody new who he was grooming, um, seeing it, testing the waters to see if they were somebody he could go as far as he did with me. Um, and so I think, every, you know, here he was at fourth grade and every year he would have his new favorite. And you kind of saw that as you progressed through the grades uh, in school, you would kind of look back and see new fourth graders getting called to his room and and whatnot. Yes, I would. And actually, you would get kind of jealous about that, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, I would. And I mean, from a child's perspective, yeah, I did. And uh, it's messed up. And I do think one of the things that... um, survivors of this type of stuff experience is guilt because they look back at some of their reactions to things and they hold themselves responsible for feeling the way that they did. And I think it's very important to let those feelings go because in a way you didn't have control of those feelings. He was like a puppet master and he was controlling how I felt, even the roller coaster ride of him being all about me for a while to having nothing to do with me and all of the mind games. And, um, it just made it to where I carried a guilt that wasn't mine to carry. And you mentioned also the fact that you didn't get officially sold or anything in, in junior high or in high school. I forget what time, but you said that you would, you know, get taken to this white house, uh, out past the edge of town and it was basically a, a sex ring, if I understand what a sex ring is. Like there, people would come and pay to have sex with you and presumably a number of different girls that were were there. And c- I mean, could you just tell us a little bit about that? Like it's insane to think that type of thing exists, especially in a small town like that. I'll, I'll let you say stuff. I could just repeat the whole story, but I don't. I didn't live it. You did so. Well, in my opinion, it was basically a brothel. I mean, you hear about brothels in other countries and such. That's basically what that was. Um, And yeah, it was hell on earth. I could hear cries from other people. I didn't always see where the cries were coming from. Um, There's a lot that happened there that I don't mention in my book. Um, But for one reason, I, you know, I don't want to traumatize somebody just simply from what I've been through. But understanding that those hidden places exist. Um, and honestly, it was extremely validating for me then as an adult to find that place, to go back there with granny and to walk through the doors and have it be so eerily similar to how it was even 20 years before. Um, and under, you know, talking to the, the owner and understanding that this house has been vacant for 30 years. Um, and just all the ins and outs of how it was exactly how I had remembered was good for me because when you disassociate and then all of a sudden all these memories come back, there's part of you that's like, is this real or not? And then I have so many people in my life who haven't, you know, believed or whatever. It was validating for me to be able to walk back through that house. It was difficult, but it was validating. So interesting. It's it's so crazy how there's been cases where someone experiences something when they're a kid that everyone just writes off and eventually the person believes you know what somehow I don't know how it seems so real but I did I did imagine that and then later it's very rare but it has happened where someone no this thing actually did happen at this time and, and you were right and it's just like I mean what a crazy feeling that would be and I want to ask now did this and I'm, it's kind of a rhetorical question, you know. I I know a bit of the answer, but like, did did this man ever get put in jail or anything? Your your coach, or did he go to court? What happened after you know after you graduated? Well, um, nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing happened after I graduated. I went on about my life um, in my head at that point, even though I I knew the twistedness of 
um, our relationship. Somehow I thought it was just me. I had still stuffed a lot of those dark, dark memories to, to know otherwise. Um, it wasn't until I was an adult and all those memories had come back after I had seen that Facebook page. Um, and then just the thought of another little girl, and it was a little girl I knew spending time with him after school, knowing what happens alone when you're alone with him. I mean, I ran to the bathroom and I puked and I puked and I puked. It destroyed me. And so at that point, I started to get help for myself. Um, I started to go to a Christian counselor, but I also knew that I needed to make sure that that little girl was okay. And so that's when I started to have some conversations with police officers. Um, and then we got DCFS involved in Illinois. Was I supposed to say that? Um, but everyone knows from that area, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's from that area. Um, and so, you know, they started to investigate to make sure that little girl was okay. And, um, as far as justice goes, there has not been justice for me. Um, there's not been justice for him. Um, we have gone to local police, state police, FBI. I had an amazing FBI officer who, um, she was able to take my case. She was able to connect people's bank accounts. And, um, you know, I didn't, I know, I know faces. I don't know names. Um, but granny, and I talk about her in the book, but she knew names from the area. And so we were able to present names to this FBI agent who was able to make these connections. And she explained to us, this ring is humongous. It goes all the way down to Mexico. And she had all of these things, including, um, I was told evidence of child pornography that all just was gone. Um, everything was dropped. The, I don't necessarily know hundred percent what happened with the evidence that was found from my coach's house. Um, but it was gone. And from what I understand, my case is sitting in a file on some FBI agent's desk and, you know, it's up to them whether they want to open it or not. And there's really not too much that I can do about it at this point. Have any similar stories to yours came up since then in that town that you lived in? Jeff, do you want to answer that or I can? Uh, you, you go ahead, but my answer is yes. <sighs> okay. Please. Yeah, yeah. So when, when my book came out um, in November of 2020, boy, these years, these COVID years, they kind of blend <laughs> together. But it was November of 2020, um, my book came out and I didn't um, publicize it. I didn't put it on Facebook. I didn't do anything. I just, it just got published. Well, about four months after that, somebody um, from my hometown made a post on Facebook and it was about my book and was kind of like a, why is nobody saying anything? Like, what the heck? I remember this guy. I remember him showing me this special treatment and I, you know, this, this, and this. And from her one post, then it was like, it gave a green light to people to be able to say, yeah, me too. And from that, I have received support that I never thought I would get prior to my book coming out. I would say 75, 80% of people believed him. They thought that I was just out to get him. Um, and then they read my book and they understood, they, they heard the details. I, I know what the inside of his house looks like, like all these things. They're like, okay, this, there's no way this is made up at this point. Um, and so then I would say it, it turned to where 90% probably believe me now. And with that, other people are feeling safe enough to come forward. Now, majority of the women that have come forward are ones that went through grooming, the grooming process with him. They were touched inappropriately. Um, they were humiliated in front of their class. Um, they experienced some things at his house. Um, the ones who went through all that I did I don't feel are feel safe enough to come forward yet. Um, we have heard from um, some details about the White House, um, which was validating for me of a girl being taken there. 
And you talk but, about the White um, House on the uh, past the edge of town, on, not the White the, House. Yes, not the yeah. not capital W, capital I know. H. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> no, no, no. The little White House. Um, okay. So, yes, there's been everybody has their own story, but it's so eerily similar how he groomed and messed with so many in such in a similar way. Yeah, yeah. We, we've interviewed over. 14 individuals, including former students and staff and faculty at the schools that have said the same exact thing happened to them that she's talking about happened at school in the classroom. So there are other individuals out there um, and we would love to encourage them if they do have a story to tell to come forward. But uh, we understand also that it's in their time. You know, they, they can only do it when they're ready to do it. Mm -hmm. And and coming out about this type of thing can often be, a, you know, put their life at risk in some cases. So, of course, I mean, I'm sure threats have been made towards them if they speak out. And I mean, what better way to keep someone silent about that? And of course, you write about that in your book. So, I mean, man, they'd have to feel extra safe if they were to get the courage to come out about this type of thing, I, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. But I feel like there's power in numbers. Um, safety in numbers. And so um, coming together um, as a sisterhood almost and standing up for what's right. But I wholeheartedly support somebody's decision if they feel like it's not right for them. Um, you know, it's it's not been easy for me by any means to come forward. Uh, but the healing, the healing has been better, I do feel like, since coming forward. Oh, absolutely. Getting all that off of your chest and um, I want to ask, what did you said that people at the beginning originally believed your coach over you and what was he saying? How did he write this all off? And yeah. Um, I've heard a couple different things. Um, one person shared that he explained to them that we had an affair and I was just trying to get back at him. Um, I've also heard that he said I was just madly in love with them and was trying to get back at him for that. Um, it, I'm not real sure, uh, cause I haven't obviously been a part of those, but those were just things that were said to me that he has said to others. And is he still in that area? Yes. He doesn't still work at the school, does he? He has retired. Okay. Well, that's unsettling. That's kind of crazy. My goodness. Um, yeah. Huh. I didn't actually know that. So uh, let's move on then to the next part of your life. Man, that's really tough though. Gosh, I, I wonder if anyone from that area is going to watch this. But anyway, so moving on to this next part of your life, it, it really gets pretty crazy. I mean, you, you uh, married your husband after just three months of of dating him. And <laughs> yes. Well, if, hold on now. No, we got engaged and now we, then we were engaged oh, you're right. for yep. like a year and a half. So <laughs> <laughs> you're right. My bad. Yes. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you, before you guys were married, did you tell them about your past, you know, your upbringing and all this stuff? Goodness. No, cause I didn't even necessarily understand it all. Hmm. Um, you know, there were times throughout like dating, um, and different things where I would say something like, I do feel like there's some really something just in my past that I'm that just dark, something that I can't put my fingers on. Um, but no, like I, I still very much had, uh, the thought process that he was a good guy, that we had our secret, but he was a good guy. And so I didn't share any of that with really anybody. No, wait, he's a good guy. Are you referring to your coach? That was, yes. Yeah, right. Man, that is so interesting. In why did you think he was a good guy? Maybe you can actually tell me that. Like what 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 was your rationale behind that? Well, so mind you, I didn't have the memories at that point of of all the dark stuff. I just knew um the relationship style of it. And um all I can say is uh traumatized brain. I had trauma mind and and it goes back to, um, when I was a kid, if somebody would have come to me and asked me is, is he hurting you? I would have said, absolutely not. No way. Like I would have stuck up to, for him to the ends of the earth. 
that's how that trauma bond, how strong it was. And it wasn't until it all broke through in 2014 that it was, my eyes were opened myself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of the times a dog that's regularly abused by its owner will still attack and, and defend his owner because he still loves his owner for a number of reasons. It's, man, it's very interesting. Uh-oh. Her, okay. Sorry. So Sorry. You're, you're fine. But uh, okay. So that that's all very fascinating. And, you know, we're, we're talking about your adult life now. And this is kind of the point where things get, they're so crazy that it leads some people to wonder if they are in fact 100% fact. And you talked about, mm -hmm. you know, how some deals that you made because you wanted to help your coach who was trying to turn his life around and you wanted to protect your family as well. You were regularly or semi-regularly picked up by these guys who are involved in this sex ring type of thing. You were picked up in the middle of the night. This is when you were married and your husband wouldn't mm -hmm. wake up and they would rev their engines outside and you would you go out there and they would take you somewhere and they would, for lack of a better term, have their way with you. And I saw you were on Dr. Phil, you know, and, mm -hmm. and your husband said that he never had woken up during this type of thing. So mm -hmm. maybe you could just tell us a little more about that, you know, defend your yourself in this situation. And I guess I'll just leave it at that. You know, what? Tell us more about that. Yeah. And I've had some people who have completely written off my whole story because my husband didn't wake up to the revving engines. Um, my husband didn't wake up to the kids crying at night. My husband didn't. I mean, he just he's a heavy sleeper. Um, and he would tell you now he hears the revving engines. And because we you know, that's something that we still battle. We still hear. And so he hears it now. Um, he saw on the video cameras when men would show up at our house. And, you know, I had a guy show up at my house and every bit of it was on tape because we had cameras around our house. Um, and he had a black whip in his back pocket. He had a sack full of toys. And at this point in my life, um, I didn't have police who were helping protect me whatsoever. And so granny had empowered me to go out there, make sure I have my phone on and tell him to get off my property. And then I want nothing to do with him to start fighting back for myself. And so I did. And I told him to leave and he's like, but I've already paid for you. I'm like, what do you mean you've already paid for me? And he said, yeah, I've already paid for you. Let's go in the house. And I was like, I, I don't know who you talked to, but that wasn't me and you need to leave. And so he did, thank God, he dropped three condoms on my sidewalk in the process, um, was all flustered. And so he just left them and drove off. All of this is on camera. Is there a um, video somewhere of it? Like, is it, is it absolutely? Online? Oh, so I don't know. I gave it to the police. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. I gave it to the police. I didn't post anything online, but granny then ended up, she was coming to, to help stopped the man in the road and told them, you know, give me your, I got your license number, give me your name and give me where you found her at. And, um, he did. And so then we call the police and the police come over and they look at the video, you know, they're kind of scratching their head because I mean, they don't believe me. And here, here's obvious proof of something that, that just happened. Um, and we get word about a week later, only because we contacted the police um, they said the license plate was not registered. The name was fake and the state's attorney would not look into the website that the guy gave us. And so just like that, everything didn't matter. Um, and so, yes, my husband slept through revving engines, but I, I mean, in Illinois, you hear revving engines, like that's not that big of a deal. He had absolutely no idea that his wife was being sex trafficked and leaving at night. He would wake up in the middle of the night and I wouldn't be in bed. But in his mind, I was laying with a child. I wasn't out being sex trafficked. That doesn't cross a husband's mind. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's bizarre. And um, I get that it's hard to wrap your head around. And I, I understand that, you know, a lot of people want to write off my story because those details in their life don't make sense. But that was our reality. I mean, that that is legit what happened. Have you ever seen the Jeffrey Epstein documentary on Netflix? Mm -mm. I forget what it's called. It's called like Evil Rich. I don't know what it's called. 
But uh, he talks about, you know, these a lot of these girls that he would, well, he would traffic, he would bring to his place and pay them. And they also, you know, similar to what you went through. Um, and, and they would go to the police and even go to the police in numbers. And the police would, because they were in kind of these weird cahoots with Epstein or at least Epstein's connections, they would wind up, you know, getting money or getting, they would get some kind of deal. Maybe they were in on this type of thing. They would write it off and say, we didn't find anything. You know, you're, you know, you're lying. This lying thing is, holy cow. It's, uh, you know, accusing these women of lying is incredibly effective at writing off the in- entire case, which I assume is madly frustrating. I, I assume some of them that have, you know, now have clear enough evidence that this stuff truly did happen that were in this documentary. Some of them were even questioning, like, did it really happen? Because if you have everyone telling you that what you said did not in fact happen, you might start to question if it really did because 10 people might make more sense than one person, just you imagining the whole thing. And I just wonder, you know, maybe if that, because these police saying, you know, there's, there's nothing here. We ran the license plate. There's nothing. It's not registered. Like that sounds just a little bit too, too fishy. It's just so strange. Do you ever suspect that something like that could have happened? Um, so I, I believe that there's people involved probably in every police station. Um, I think it's, it's infiltrated itself into most organizations, most businesses, there's somebody there who is involved in something like this. And so it takes one higher up person to quiet you know, a local police. Um, but you also have the situation where police are not informed. They understand drug trafficking. They understand prostitution style trafficking where it's in Las Vegas or big cities or whatever, but this type of trafficking people are not educated on. And so it sounds like, well, like what I was told, you watch too many movies. Um, and so they, they won't even give it the time of day because it's not something that they've been trained on, understand, or think could even happen. Um, the reality is there are brothels hidden in, you know, in campers out in the woods, um, in buildings and sheds and warehouses. They're everywhere and they're, we're driving by them all the time and we don't even realize it. Um, are there some police involved? Absolutely. I mean, you're going to find evil everywhere. I also wholeheartedly believe there are some really good officers out there who are trying to do their part and, um, you know, want to do right by me and about by my story and all that. But when you have somebody higher up who's shutting things down, your hands are tied. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you said there's evil people everywhere. I'm a devout Catholic. And if you can see this crucifix behind me and I will, you know, obviously acknowledge that there have been some horribly evil underground sex rings within the Catholic Church among priests and I think even some some bishops and whatnot. And it's just, yeah, evil exists everywhere and it's right in front of us, but we just don't know it. And sometimes these underground sex rings and uh, brothels and things that you're talking about can be so advanced and so uh, intelligent, really, in their design. And it's similar to the underground drug trade that would just kind of blow us away with how advanced and how many people are involved and how it's really everywhere. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And just because it's we're claiming that it's elaborate doesn't mean that it's unlikely. It's Yeah. And I was told by one police officer that, you know, they're going to do the craziest stuff to you purposefully, because then when I go to have to explain to a police officer this crazy, elaborate story they're going to be less likely to believe me. It's all done on purpose. That's and I, I've talked yeah. to victims that have been told that their case is just too difficult, too hard, and which is sad, but it, it is. You add everything into it and trying to explain it and have them understand it, they just don't get it. Man, it just makes me want to break the law and go to one of these places and just bulldoze it down and run away and say, look, see, see all that stuff? You know, it's yeah. wow incredible and you know we're, we're kind of getting towards the end of this whole conversation thank you so much i know it's been pretty time consuming for you but i want to ask this question with all due respect really but does any part of you and i know dr phil kind of talked about this and some people they're they're murmurs of this type of thing but 
Does any part of you, Rachel, consider the possibility even that perhaps some of the events experienced in your adult life, not your young life, but your adult life, were products of the mental destruction done by the traumatic events of your childhood? Or are you as certain that they happened how you said they happened, as as certain that they were as real as this conversation right now? I'm a thousand percent certain. There's there's too many um, proof proofs and um, validations and things on. I mean, wounds on my body. I mean, everything has come together to where what I'm remembering is then validated in something else. And so I I do believe that you know I was very traumatized as a child, and I know that I have you know PTSD and. Uh, dissociating difficulties and um, which, you know, I, they still capitalize on today when they can, but I know it happens and it's still, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a figment of my imagination. It's not me making, you know, something from the past seem like it's happening in the future or in the present. It's just not. And I understand that it's easier sometimes to accept that like that, that's easier for people to put in their head that, oh, she's, you know, she's just traumatized. But the reality is I still have issues with men showing up at my house. I still have that problem. And so if I have to pretend like this isn't real, I'm going to be in trouble again. So I can't just say this is a figment of my imagination. And and I'll add to that during the time that I've been on Rachel's case, I've seen individuals, I've seen, um, I've been there when people are doing surveillance on her. Um, the, the cyber piece of it, the individuals that have been involved, the things that we have discovered through the investigation, um, I'm 100% on board with her as well. And I, I believe her. I mean, everything that she has said can be backed up and validated um, throughout all of it. So, you know, and and again, people may think that this doesn't happen just because they don't understand it. And just because they don't understand it, that means that they need to discount it. Her story is more common than people realize. And there are more victims out there in her situation than people realize. And when you said, Jeff, that you saw people doing surveillance on her home, what did that look like? You said you actually saw that. Vehicles sitting there parked, watching. Uh, There were men walking in front of our house. Uh, There was one night that uh, I was driving by our house. There was an individual walking. He walked. He was parked a distance away from our house. He gets in the car. I follow them. He stops, confronts me. Um, And then, you know, things like that happen. Hmm. Not often, but they do happen. But you've never seen someone like with a video camera or anything. It's it's not like that. It's not where they're just sitting there recording. No. I got a picture of a guy that I sent you taking pictures of me. That's I mean, true. There was one guy, yeah. Hmm. Wow. So hey. it's yeah. Oh, go ahead. Were you gonna say something? Well, I get I understand that it's so far fetched for people to wrap their heads around it. And I want to show grace in that. But again, unless you've lived it and there's no way for you to discount something until you know 100% for certain that this isn't true. Right, right. And so just to put it on the record, you know, put it clearly, you you stand by everything you said in the book that it, it truly did happen, including the the events of your adult life, you know, being taken to this place and the people coming to your home and and abusing you even while you're in your home, like those things did happen and you stand by them, correct? Yes. Okay. Just, you know, I'm not asking for myself because of any doubt that I have. I'm asking because, you know, in my research, I find that a lot of people do are hesitant about this. So I thought I'd, you know, come right to the source and and get your opinion on that. Thank you. And absolutely. And thank you for answering. And as we're winding down here, I, I want to ask you, you know, what a life you've lived what do you credit or who do you credit for getting you through this or helping you get through this? Because it's nothing short of a miracle that you're, you are who you are today. So how'd you do it? Um, 
I didn't do anything. It is a hundred percent God. And I know that's the cliche answer, but even to this day, just my everyday walk with him and understanding how he's my comforter. He's my source of hope. He's the reason I'm still alive. He's the one giving me purpose for my pain. You know, I, I do not believe that God, um, made it to where I was trafficked. I don't think that was, you know, his choice, but I do think he walked me through it. I think he's using it for good. Um, I have created relationships with people who have been through similar things that I never would have gotten the opportunity to be able to touch their lives and them touch my life and being able to then share this redemption that God has done in my life. I mean, we spent the time talking about all of the evilness and the darkness and how awful sex trafficking is, and it needs to be talked about and eyes need to be opened. And I'm willing to educate anybody on it, um, willing to help any parent on how to equip their children, what signs to see, all of those types of things. But the biggest thing I feel like that needs to be shouted from the mountaintops is the way that God got me out of it. And I'm able to share that. I'm able to share that, you know, I'm free. I am, I have my hope in him. I, whatever bondage and crap they did to me, even starting at nine years old, I can now say that I'm free from that. And I'm living my fullest life. I am still very traumatized. You know, I have moments of just falling apart, but I, I have the tools to equip me with God, with his word, with his worship. And I, I just can't say enough about how my understanding of where he was in my pain, my understanding of where he is now has made it to where I can go on and live my life and not be stuck in that dark pit of a, of a hell that I lived through. Right. And, and a hell, it really was in a technical sense. I mean, that's as close to hell as you can get on on earth pure chaos pure you know abandonment oh it's terrible and but what a heck of a testimony you have i mean that's incredibly powerful stuff and it shows that you're doing the most good you can given the horrible situation you live through and i think that's what life is really all about but no one ever gets uh hardly ever does anyone make good out of something so bad so I'm, i mean i'm honestly i'm proud of you and i'm at the same time i'm sorry and you know thank you so much for sharing all this and before we wrap up though jeff is there anything you'd like to say about your organization or maybe how people can contribute to it um sure i mean we have, we have a website uh the guardians rising.org but i i mainly wanted to just say that uh, we know that there are other cases like Rachel's out there that are not getting the attention that they deserve. They're not getting the help that they deserve. So we just want to reach out to those individuals. Uh, Rachel is phenomenal at talking to victims. And uh, when she shares her story, she reaches out to these victims and is able to come alongside them and help them get to where Rachel is now. So we want to offer that to them. We know that there's people out there that have tried to go to law enforcement. They've tried to get help. They don't have a granny like Rachel had. So we want to offer that to them and just try to help out any way that we can. So check us out on the website and uh, uh, send us a message on Facebook. However you want to contact us. We got email, phone numbers, Facebook Messenger, any way possible. And uh, we'll try to help out any way that, that, you know, any way possible. Awesome. Well, Thank you both so much for talking with me today. Rachel, your story is astonishing, and I commend you for your bravery and your faith. You're an incredible woman, and it has been an honor speaking with you, and, and thank you as well, Jeff, for your time. You're doing some great things as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. The pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much for watching that episode of The Paul Garcia Show. If you appreciate this episode, please give it a like, leave a comment, and most importantly, give it a share to bring awareness to the horrors of sex trafficking as well as to just how prevalent it is. If you appreciate this show, a fantastic and zero-cost way to support it is by subscribing to my page on YouTube and liking my page on Facebook and following my page on Instagram, all under the same name, The Paul Garcia Show. 
If you want to support this show's production financially, which is very much appreciated, please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash Paul Garcia, where you can get early access to each and every episode and have your name run across the bottom of the screen at the beginning of every show, all for as little as $1 a month. Also, you can donate on Venmo any dollar amount to username at The Paul Garcia Show. Until next Sunday, I'm your host, Paul Garcia. God bless and have a great week. <laughs>